Thanks for coming out to the EFF panel. Um, just for the tiny portion of you that don't know what the EFF is, I'm going to introduce you to our fine organization before we all introduce ourselves and talk to you a little bit about the law and then let you ask us questions about the law. Um, EFF is one of the oldest uh, civil liberties organizations that's working at the intersection between the digital world and the world of law and policy. Uh, back in the 90s, we worked with Phil Zimmerman and PGP to make sure that free crypto could be exported to the world. Uh, a few years ago, when Dmitry Sklyarov was arrested here at DEF CON, he came to us. We helped find him legal counsel. We worked with Adobe to get their charges against him dropped. Um, and also, more recently, when Avi Rubin and Dan Wallach got that uh, leaked Diebold source code, they came to us about it and helped get us started on a campaign to make sure that e-voting machines are secure and hopefully voter, fair, voter verifiable uh, before this upcoming election. Um, I'm Annalie Newitz. I'm EFF's first ever policy analyst, and I'm the newest person uh, at EFF that's here today. Um, I think we're each just going to introduce ourselves briefly, and then um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more, and then move on. So Seth, I think you have to go first, because you're closest to the microphone. Okay. I'm Seth Schoen. I'm a staff technologist. I was the first ever staff technologist at EFF. We now have, as of tomorrow, nine staff attorneys and two staff technologists. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kevin Bankston. I'm one of the attorneys. I'm actually technically the Bruce J. Ennis Fellow, which means the foundation pays my salary. Bruce Ennis was a legendary First Amendment litigator who argued the CDA case, which I think many of you are familiar with. I was doing the internet free speech beat at the ACLU before I came to EFF, and I'm still working on free speech issues as well as, most particularly, online privacy in the face of government surveillance post 9-11. So Patriot Act is my beat. Uh, Wendy Seltzer, I'm another staff attorney. I focus on intellectual property issues, and I run the Chilling Effects Clearinghouse at chillingeffects.org, uh, helping folks who've received cease and desist letters over online activity. Also involved in fighting against DMCA, fighting against uh, bad software patents in our new software patent busting campaign. And for the one of you who might not know, EFF is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, online at EFF.org. Very important to add that. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm the only person here who doesn't work for the EFF. I'm the executive director of the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. It's an academic program that studies the intersection of civil liberties and technological change. And I'm a criminal defense attorney by training. And Jennifer has worked with us a lot. She's an honorary EFFer. <laughs> So I just want to remind you, as if you haven't heard already, if you've come by our booth in the vendor area, we're a nonprofit organization, which means it's donations from folks like you and other people that help us survive and help fight for your digital liberties. So we really appreciate the fact that DEF CON is donating the proceeds from the dunk tank to us at DEF CON, which means you can right now, well, after the panel, you can go dunk Dark Tangent in our name. Uh, we thank you. Uh, and so, uh, and also, please come by our booth. Uh, we're in the vendor area. We've got lots of interesting goodies. We've got propaganda. We've got the Myth TV box that uh, Wendy and Seth will be explaining uh, on their panel at 6 p.m. Uh, we've got stickers. We've got T-shirts. We've got everything. So come by, say hi, give us a donation, uh, and we'd really appreciate it. Uh, so today's uh, panel is basically sort of an EFF unplugged panel. We have no PowerPoint. Uh, we have, <laughs> yes, I think that is worth an, a round of applause. We have no PowerPoint, we have no technical demos, um, so we're going naked into this talk. Um, <laughs> uh, basically what we're going to do is each of us is going to talk for about five minutes about a particular legal case that's interested us in the past year, uh, and then we're just going to hand it over to you guys to ask us uh, whatever questions you have. 
So this is your chance. If you have a burning legal question to ask us, a policy question, uh, anything, you know, you can offer us a, an imaginary scenario in which a friend of yours might be reverse engineering something. Uh, and we can talk to you about that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand this over now to the person who's going to speak first, which is Jennifer Granick. Thanks, Annalee. And I want to thank the EFF for letting me crash their panel here. So um, this year I worked on a case which was the United States versus Brett McDaniel. And uh, this case involved a uh, guy who used to work for a company that did uh, internet messaging, where you could get your voicemails, your emails, all sorts of messages in one consolidated place. He worked there, and while he was working there, he realized that the web messaging service had a problem. And the problem was that uh, you could see the session ID in the URL which meant that the next website, as many of you probably already realize, meant that the next website that somebody went to would reveal the session ID for the person's webmail service, and anybody who had access to the logs for that next website could go back and read the customer's email. Well, um, Brett McDaniel told his company about this problem, and um, they had a fix for it, but they did not implement the fix. Um, many months later, he had left the company, and he realized that the company still had not addressed this problem. So he sent an email to the customers of his former employer telling them about this problem and directing them to a website where they could get more information about how they could protect themselves from it. The company did not like this. They reported him to the FBI, and Mr. McDaniel was ch charged with a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1030. The surprising thing was that he was convicted of that charge and sentenced to 16 months in prison. At that point in time, I became involved in the case and took it up on appeal. Now, my argument on appeal was twofold. First, it was about an interpretation of the statute, and, the st and second, it was about the First Amendment. The statute, 18 U.S.C. 1030, is the general anti-computer crime statute, and it prohibits unauthorized access to computers, which causes damage. And damage is defined as uh, harm to the availability or to the integrity of data on a computer system. And what the government, the Department of Justice, argued in this case is that when Mr. McDaniel told people that this system was insecure, he damaged the integrity of the system because now people knew it was insecure and they could come by and they could read people's email. So my argument was, first of all, <laughs> my argument was, first of all, that the statute does not define damage in that way, that harm to the integrity of a system means something other than the fact that people know that it is already insecure. My second argument was a First Amendment argument, that even if this were the interpretation, that this were a proper interpretation under the statute, the First Amendment would prohibit it because free speech means that we can tell truthful things without fear <laughs> of civil or criminal reprisals. Now, the really interesting thing about this case is that after I filed my brief on appeal, the government asked for more time for their brief, which, you know, we always, we lawyers, we always ask for more time. Delay is what justice is all about. And reluctantly, I said yes. Sadly, my client had already spent the full 16 months in prison by the time the appeal was perfected and we were able to file. Um, but when the government, it came time for the government to file their opposition to the appeal, they did not file the opposition. Instead, they agreed with me that the conviction was wrong and that it should be overturned. And they made a motion for the Ninth Circuit to overturn, to reverse it and to remand it to the trial court to overturn it. So uh, they did the right thing, but a little too late. What's the important thing about the case, to know about the case? Well, in this motion that they filed to overturn or agree, where they agreed that I was right, which I had never expected in a million years, they explained the government's position on when vulnerability disclosure is something that can get you could potentially get you in criminal or civil trouble. And this is the clearest statement I think we have so far of what the government's statement is. So on one hand, we have something very good. On one hand, the government says telling somebody that a computer system is insecure is not a violation of federal law. So good news there. But they said, but 
if you tell or disclose information with either the intent that somebody take that information and use it to compromise or break into or gain unauthorized access to a system, then that can be criminal, either as aiding and abetting or as, if there's an agreement, as conspiracy or something like that. Okay, now that, so intent, disclosure with intent could be criminal. The other thing they said is that disclosure to somebody with knowledge that that person is then going to use that information um, to, to uh, commit unauthorized access, that that perhaps also could be something you could be pursued for criminally. So intent means it's what you desire, knowledge is what you know, it's two different concepts in the law. But the government said with either of these additional factors present, then perhaps the case would be right. But in my case, since none of those facts were there, the conviction was clearly wrong. So I think this is an object lesson for people to realize. First of all, to some extent it's true, the uh, First Amendment is still uh, solid and everything's okay here in the United States. But on the other hand, there are circumstances under which that general rule might end up being something different, and you want to be uh, very careful that you are not a person who is harboring that kind of criminal intent, or even necessarily acting in a way where you know that information that you're putting out there will certainly be helping someone who you're giving that information to, to commit a crime. Okay, so the case is United States versus McDaniel. Um, the, all the papers and the pleadings and the government's motion are up on our website at uh, the school where I work, which and our website is cyberlaw.stanford.edu. So that's my uh, case that interested me this year. I think our process, I see a question here, but I think our process is, should I take the question or should we? Uh, one question from this gentleman in the red hat. Well, it, it may come as a major shock to everybody in this room, but some hackers do read bug track. If I post a bug track. <laughs> He's asking me about bug track and what, what's the situation there. So, you know, the, this is one of those kind of gets, lets me talk a little bit about how the law can be complicated. You know, what's intent and what, what's knowledge is a question about what's inside somebody's head, right? So how do you prove what's inside somebody's head? Well, you know, we can't, we don't have mind readers yet. So you'd prove it by circumstantial evidence, the, the factors and circumstances that surround the, in, the, the transmission of the information. And bug track is a public mailing list, a public, dis, public information to people who are computer security specialists and press and other interested parties. It's, um, it's very similar to the kind of disclosure that happened in my, click, my case where he was telling customers. He wasn't giving the information to a person where he knew that that person was going to misuse the information. Now the case law on this is not great. There are cases in which people have been prosecuted for giving information to a general group of people at a public gathering. But those cases are pretty rare. Um, it is kind of, it, generally, public disclosure of information to a group of, of similarly interested people, I think, akin to bug track, is going to be exactly the type of thing that's going to be protected by the First Amendment. As I said, there are a few cases that go a little bit otherwise, and mostly that's in the tax protester context, where people were giving information about how to um, evade taxes to people who were there to listen to a seminar on how to evade taxes. But um, I think that, so the, there's no clear black and white answer in the, in the law, but a thing like bug track probably is and certainly should be perfectly fine. So, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. So, I was here last year talking a little bit about chilling effects, and one of the things that I said that we do with the chilling effects website, where we collect cease and desist letters, is to use it to look for interesting cases. Um, as in all of the cases, we publish the letters that we receive to help people understand what the uh, legal jargon really means when a lawyer says it. But we also look through those for cases that would be good cases for EFF to use in its activist litigation. We take on cases where people need help that they're not getting from uh, the rest of the legal system, and cases where we can make good law by taking up fact patterns and legal issues that haven't yet been considered. Uh, so one of those cases that we saw early last year, around uh, October or so, as election time was rolling around, was a case of some email archives that had leaked out of Diebold, the electronic voting machine company. And these were email archives among their technicians talking about the things that techies talk about on email lists, 
the bugs that they were finding, the problems they were finding, the security flaws that they saw, the demos that wouldn't work right when they brought these machines out into the field, the insecurities, the system tests that they'd rename so that it would pass some of the certification requirements, sorts of things that don't make you really comfortable about the way our electronic voting is being counted. Uh, so these things leaked out, not quite sure how, it, that's never come out. And around the internet, people found them and reposted them. Mirrors spring up often when there's speech that's being suppressed. And this case, uh, students at, uh, at schools across the country started posting these. News organizations started posting them and referring them to referring to them, reporting on the security problems with electronic voting. And uh, so some students at Swarthmore posted copies of these email messages. The folks at Indie Media linked to some of the email archives and their descriptions of <coughs> flaws in e-voting. And Diebold's response was to assert copyright. Our employees wrote these memos, therefore we own the copyright take them down. And they did this because the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, one of its lesser known provisions, everybody here probably knows about the anti-circumvention provisions, it's also got a safe harbor for ISPs. And that's supposed to be a good thing. It keeps the ISP safe from claims of copyright infringement when one of its users wants to m make a posting. It keeps the ISP out of trouble so they don't have to watch everything that their users are doing every moment but can wait until they get a notice. But the backside of that is that when the ISP does get a notice, DMCA Safe Harbor says, take it down and you won't be liable, leave it up and you might be liable. So what does an ISP do when it gets one of these complaints? Takes it down expeditiously. And even though the users can file a counter notification and maybe get it put back up, uh, ISP isn't obliged to do that. So Swarthmore College got a cease and desist letter from Diebold. These emails are our intellectual property, take them down or face potential liability. Uh, Indie Media got a nasty letter. You're linking to these emails which contain our copyrighted intellectual property. Take them down or face potential liability. But wait, it gets better. Online Policy Group, the internet service provider to Indie Media, got a nasty gram. You are hosting someone who links to these email archives. <laughs> You are providing an information location tool and subject to the safe harbor provisions of the DMCA. Uh, please take it down expeditiously or face potential liability. And when Online Policy Group with EFF's counsel uh, wrote back a response saying, we believe that these do not infringe copyright, they're fair use, uh, Online Policy Group's host, the host of a host of a link or two claimed infringement, got a cease and desist letter. You are hosting someone who is hosting material that links to our infr infringing mints of our intellectual property. Take it down or uh, face potential liability. Well, at that point, we'd had it heard enough, and we went into court and filed suit against Diebold for misuse of copyright, for misuse of this provision of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, for interference with the hosting contracts that these people had with their providers. And uh, we went in first for a temporary restraining order and then converted that to a motion for a preliminary injunction to get Diebold to stop threatening people, to stop interfering with the posting of these important commentaries on the security of our voting systems. Uh, as soon as we went into court, or shortly after, and there we were privileged to work with Jennifer Granick and the Stanford Cyber Law Clinic, uh, who represented the Swarthmore students whose material was taken offline. Uh, we at EFF represented Online Policy Group, the nonprofit ISP who was hosting Indie Media and didn't want to make the DMCA takedown. Uh, we went into court. Pretty shortly after we got into court, Diebold's started backing away. No, we didn't really mean it. We didn't really mean to sue anybody. We just wanted you to take that material down. <laughs> um, and they retracted all of their threats. They said that they wouldn't sue anybody for the non-commercial posting of these email archives discussing uh, their e-voting machines. And that still wasn't enough for us. We continued the case in the courts because we wanted a declaration that you can't just make these idle threats. 
You can't just go around saying, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to sue you, and then wait until, make them hire a lawyer before you say, oh, we didn't really mean it, sorry, go away. Uh, that's not good enough. That's not going to cut it, and we can't let people be chilled that way. We, su we continued to ask the court for a declaratory judgment, which is our way of going in and affirmatively saying, tell them to stop making these legal threats. Um, and we kept up the case for misuse of copyright and misuse of the DMCA. Now, I said that that started out in November. We are still waiting for a decision on that case. Uh, we had hearings in the court in February, but uh, we are waiting, and every day we check the court's dockets to see uh, whether that opinion has come down. If it comes down our way, we think a great precedent for protecting free speech online. It's n copyright threats. You can't just make them willy-nilly. If there's not an actual claim of copyright infringement, if somebody is making fair use of a copyrighted work, if somebody is using even copyrighted material you can use for criticism and commentary and news reporting, as all of these folks were doing, you can use it for political discussion, and it's not fair to send cease and desist and litigation threats in that context. Um, so we're hoping that we get a victory there to, to hold out against other people who are making similar threats as a warning. You can't do this. There are limits to what even fancy law firms and fancy letterhead can do to chill the speech of the public online. Uh, so that's the Diebold case. We've been involved in electronic voting outside of just this copyright context. As Anna Lee mentioned, when the researchers at Rice and Johns Hopkins uh, got a hold of some Diebold source code and wanted to analyze that to see if our voting machines were secure. Um, or uh, the first question they had was, is this a trade secret? Are we going to get in trouble? Uh, is Diebold going to come sue us for having analyzed this code? And again, we at EFF were able to look at that question and to look at the important public interest, which in Ohio law factors into the question of trade secret. It's not a trade secret if you haven't taken reasonable measures to keep it secure. It's not a, also not a trade secret in Ohio, at least, and several other states, if, you've, if there's an important public interest in the publication that gets balanced against the corporation's claim to secrecy. We were able to advise them uh, that, these material, that they wouldn't face a trade secret lawsuit. They analyzed the code. They thought it was going to take them weeks or months to come up with a report. The weekend after they got it, they called us back and said, our computer science undergraduates could write better code than this. There are so many flaws in this code. <laughs> we wouldn't trust our undergraduate elections to it, never mind our national elections. Um, and so that's what got EFF involved in the electronic voting fight as a separate matter. There we're saying we shouldn't be trusting our votes to black boxes. Uh, we've been calling for a voter verified paper trail, and you may have heard some of the discussion uh, yesterday. <coughs> I believe there were some talks about that. Basically, we need to be able to audit the record of our votes. You don't need to remind everybody here that computers are fallible. and. <laughs> a paper trail would allow us to recount and make sure that nothing's screwed with our votes, no computers have crashed when we've voted, and our election process has integrity. So that's a little bit of what I've been working on at EFF. So the Patriot Act is a big bill. Um, <laughs> The 342 pages made amendments to uh, 10 different statutes, really unreadable by normal humans, unfortunately, uh, including your congressmen. Uh, the broad problem with Patriot is, is the range of investigatory techniques, including wiretapping and demands, and rec demands for records, that it allows the DOJ to engage in with minimal or no oversight or accountability. I'm going to talk to you about one of those provisions and a case that EFS has been helping on that deals with it. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, um, there's something called a national security letter, appropriately ominous sounding. Uh, it is a letter that can be issued by the local special agent in charge of your FBI office, directly by them, without review or oversight by any court. 
This letter is served on your ISP, webmail provider, or other communication service and can demand any kinds of stored transactional logs or any other non-content information about what you do online. So as long as it's not the contents of your file, so long as it's not the actual contents of your email, they can get it. IP logs, they can make them grep for who you're sending email to and who's sending email to you. Uh, basic traffic analysis stuff and whatever the ISP has or can get, they can demand with this letter. And the ISP is forever gagged from ever speaking about this, ever making public that this request was made. Uh, they can go to jail for it. Uh, concerning the letters are also classified. There's a whole other range of criminal statutes that can be applied if you were to ever reveal uh, that these national security letters were used. Now, some people have wondered, where's EFF's Patriot case? Well, there's a couple things about that. First, if we were working on one, we couldn't tell you or we'd go to jail. Uh, the other thing is, though, is that without facts, without someone actually getting served with one of these letters, we don't have standing to bring a case. And of course, because when people receive these letters and they're told you can't tell anyone, uh, they're often afraid to approach anyone, even though it's legal to go to a lawyer to deal with your process that's served on you. So there's a case in New York that uh, we found out about a couple of months ago. The ACLU, my former uh, co-workers at the ACLU, filed a lawsuit, ACLU and Doe versus Ashcroft. Uh, well, who's Doe? We don't know and ACLU can't tell us. The thing is, they filed a complaint under seal, that is completely secretly to the court, argued with the DOJ for about three weeks about what they could say without going to jail, and then rela released a heavily redacted complaint. With any and all potential facts that might exist, they can't confirm or deny whether there are any facts, redacted out. Um, so again, ACLU can't confirm or deny what is really obvious to any lawyer looking at this complaint. That is, the Doe must be some ISP that actually received one of these letters and went to the ACLU to help them challenge it. But ACLU cannot confirm or deny whether they're representing Doe, much less who Doe is, what Doe is doing, what Doe uh, has dealt with. Uh, the level of secrecy, of course, is ridiculous. Again, any educated person, uh, anyone educated in the law looking at the complaint can tell someone's gotten one of these letters. Yet the government is attempting to keep secret even the fact that these letters are being used. Uh, using FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, uh, ACLU and EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, were able to get some documents about NSLs, but basically it was just a six-page list of redactions um, <laughs> of NSLs that have been authorized since 9-11. So it's obvious that there are being used, yet, yet DOJ won't let ACLU say, we have a client that got one. Even though it's obvious that they did, it's completely unnecessary government secrecy, trying to protect a process that is very well, very possibly unconstitutional, that's what the case is about, does this violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, and they are also challenging the scope of the gag order, which uh, under the First Amendment, because again, there's no legitimate national security reason for us not to know that this process exists and is actually being used. In fact, we had a little fight with the DOJ uh, when we got their reply brief after we had submitted our friend of the court brief helping ACLU, ACLU out. There were three words that were mistakenly unredacted. And they called us up and said, hey, could you send that back to us, please? <laughs> Uh, we need to fix that. And, and considering we're ethical lawyers and it is classified information uh, and that the judge is currently considering whether their demands are legitimate and we didn't want to jump the gun on that, we, we acceded to that request. We sent it back. But the fact is the only fact that those three words revealed were that there were facts the obvious thing that you could tell by reading the complaint. And it's just another example of overreaching secrecy, completely unnecessary, making you less safe, making you less safe because you're unable to exercise public oversight over what your government is doing. So in terms of EFF bringing a case, again, we need the facts. So keep in mind, if you run any kind of electronic communication service or know people who do, and I'm sure all of you do know many, Spread the word. If you receive some, if a federal agent comes into your office with this strange piece of paper, 
It might have the words national security on it. It might have the words terrorism investigation. It will certainly have the words don't say anything. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> <laughs> Call EFF because we want to help. We want to bring a case too. We don't want to be stuck just uh, putting in briefs for ACLU's case. They got lucky. Someone apparently they can't confirm or deny and they haven't told me anything. But apparently they had someone come to them with the facts and allow them to bring this challenge. We're looking for those facts too. So whenever the feds come and show you some strange piece of paper and say, give us this information now, come to us first and we'll help. We want to be the 911 for the internet. We're here. We're waiting. Give us a call. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That totally ruled. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to uh, talk about something that's a little bit uh, less um, intense than uh, national security letters. I want to talk about an interesting case that EFF has been helping out with involving two of my favorite topics, which are obscenity and anonymity. Uh, this is the Barbara Nitke case. Uh, and basically, in order to understand the case, I have to give you a tiny little bit of backstory. Um, there is a case back in the old 1990s uh, where the ACLU challenged an act called the Communications Decency Act. How many people remember the CDA? Okay, so the CDA was going to limit freedom of speech online, uh, and particularly what the ACLU challenged at that time was a provision of the act relating to indecent speech. And they got that act uh, taken out of the CDA in the late 90s. Um, in fact, it was a, a nearly unanimous Supreme Court that said, uh, no, uh, it's not fair to say that you can't uh, publish indecent materials online. The definition of indecency is very capacious. It's very hard to know what counts as indecent or not. Um, and that, that, and they felt that, that the Supreme Court felt that, that would hinder free speech. Um, and so a lot of people felt like the story ended there. They thought, oh, the CDA is gone. Yay, the witch is dead. We can say whatever we want online. But actually, unbeknownst to most people, the CDA lives on, just like those zombies in Night of the Living Dead. Um, and there is a little, a particularly um, zombielicious uh, part of the CDA, which is the obscenity provisions of the CDA. Um, and in, those provision, in that provision, basically, what the CDA says is, if someone puts anything obscene online uh, that is unlawful and they are liable for criminal penalties, uh, federal criminal penalties, which could include potentially jail time. Um, now, this is where it gets interesting. For those of you who know anything about how the Supreme Court defines obscenity, uh, it doesn't fit in very well with how we think of the internet. Obscenity is defined as anything that is sexual, in fact, anything that arouses the prurient interest, which is to say anything that gets you horny. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's anything that does that, which is also offensive, patently offensive, uh, to a person who is evaluating it under contemporary community standards. Now, this is the community. The community standards part is the is the part to focus on because. Typically and historically, the way community standards have been defined is through reference to a geographical location. So for example, if you're living in Alabama, uh, which is a state where recently uh, it was determined that it's illegal to sell sex toys, um, your notion of what counts as obscene or not is going to be very different from my notion of what's obscene in San Francisco, where we have feminist sex toy shops. Um, yay. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, so basically, the question is, well, how do you enforce these kinds of uh, geographical uh, community standards on the internet, uh, which has typically been a place where uh, people do not have to identify themselves by their geographical location, and in fact, if I put up a website, um, as the plaintiff in this case, Barbara Nitke, did, uh, which has materials that might be considered obscene in some geographical locations, well, how do I make sure that somebody in Alabama doesn't see my website? Um, how do I protect myself against that kind of liability? So for a while, uh, a lot of lawyers and activists felt like it wasn't a good idea to challenge this provision of the CDA because they felt that uh, they sort of wanted to take a don't ask, don't tell approach to it. You know, if we challenge this section, what if we get a really bad ruling that says that um, the internet community is defined by what's often referred to as the lowest common denominator, which since I'm picking on Alabama, I'll just say 
what would happen if it was determined that Alabama should set the community standards for the internet because they are the most conservative area and so in order to protect the entire community we have to adopt their standards. Um, but indeed a couple of years ago a plaintiff did come forward. Um, that is Barbara Nitke. She's a New York uh, erotic photographer. She has a website at barbaranitke.com that you can go find right now if you actually want to use uh, the DEF CON network. Um, <clears throat> actually, I mean, it might be good for erotic uh, websites. I don't know. Um, so uh, so she, she basically said she, she was supported by um, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, and EFF has been helping out with the case as well. We filed a friend of the court brief, and we've helped them get some expert witnesses. She said, well, how, there's, there's something like 3,000 community standards, potentially, in the U.S. How can I, as this small webmaster, uh, possibly ever protect against the possibility that someone would access my site and see some of these pictures that are erotic. Um, so she brought her case, and uh, here's where things get really hairy in terms of anonymity. Um, as, uh, we're, as, as both sides are going through the discovery process, um, Nikki's adversaries, of course, are coming up with possibilities for how uh, community standards could be enforced on the internet. Um, and one of the things that's come up is the idea that geolocation software could be used uh, by people who are putting up websites uh, in order to determine the geological, um, sorry, the geographical <laughs> location, their place in geological time, um, their, <laughs> their, uh, ge their geographical location. And I'm sure, as many of you know, um, geolocation software is notoriously crufty. Um, it doesn't work very well. Uh, and also, it can be extremely expensive. Uh, so what we may see uh, when the outcome of this case com comes out, which it will probably be in about a year or two, um, is we're, we're facing the possibility that if you want to put uh, sexually themed you know, speech or any kind of uh, expression online which a community might deem obscene, um, you're going to have to have a tremendous outlay of funds uh, in order to have geolocation software, in order to protect yourself against liability um, for obscenity. Um, and also, of course, you'll have to constantly be updating the software with every possible obscenity law from all over the U.S. to make sure that you know which places uh, need to be blocked. Um, the other part of this is that, um, as I mentioned, geolocation software doesn't really work particularly well. And what it means is that if you have a geolocation software package like many of them that turns away people who use proxies like say Tor because they don't want to be known, they want to maintain their anonymity online, um, what that means is if you wish to be anonymous online, you may no longer gain access to certain kinds of free speech. And so if the case does not go our way, um, you know, ideally we want an outcome like with the indecency provisions of the CDA where, you know, a unanimous Supreme Court says, no, we have to have free speech online, we can't use community standards to determine how everyone on the internet in the United States um, would prefer to have their entertainment. Um, if it goes the other way, we may see a regime of geolocation software for people who are putting up websites. Uh, so which prohibits free speech, but we'll also have a situation where we can no longer exercise our First Amendment rights to engage in anonymous free speech, either as speakers uh, or as listeners, as people who are trying to get access to that speech online. So this is one way in which an obscenity ruling may actually start to break uh, anonymity online, because either you'll identify yourself, you'll identify where you are in order to gain access to potentially obscene speech, um, or if you choose not to, if you choose to use a proxy, for example, you may find that you're simply turned away. Um, so that's, that's one of the cases that I'm particularly uh, interested in right now. Thanks a lot. So I don't think we could have uh, an EFF panel without talking about copyright a little. So I wanted to talk about copyright a little bit. <clears throat> we actually have a lot of copyright lawyers at EFF. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but they're out there. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, fortunately for us, thanks to member support and everything, we've been able to get up, as I was saying, to nine staff attorneys, which is quite a few. Um, so I wanted to remind all of you that we're going to be back here talking about the broadcast flag 
uh, in this very room with Wendy and I at 6 p.m. Uh, that's the television broadcast flag, and we're going to be talking about it for about an hour uh, in full historical detail and what you can do about it and so on. Uh, since we have about five minutes here to give our presentations, I thought to speak about the radio broadcast flag because there's actually another broadcast flag. Uh, they've been multiplying. They've been active. Um, the radio broadcast flag is interesting because like the video broadcast flag that we'll talk about later, it's the embodiment of a bizarre idea that entertainment publishers have talked policymakers into believing, which is the digital is different idea that if they were to publish an entertainment work or distribute an entertainment work through a digital medium, that entertainment work would be more subject to copyright infringement by virtue of having been distributed in the digital medium than it would have been if they had published it in an analog medium. Um, so for example, the theory seems to be that if you published something on CD or you streamed it online, somehow that causes copyright infringement. Whereas if they had just stuck to cassettes or vinyl records or VHS or whatever, then somehow there would be no internet copyright infringement uh, because that's analog and you can't copy analog. So <laughs> this theory is ridiculous, but policymakers have been, uh, I'm tempted to say brainwashed, there's been a publicity campaign. There's been a campaign to say, well, digital can be copied and it can be copied perfectly and analog can't. Uh, obviously, in the real world of physics, these are just representations of the same signal and you can go back and forth between representations. And if you don't like that something is in analog, then you can digitize it and then you have a digital representation. Uh, so to give a concrete example of where this argument is currently being advanced that we're working on, the recording industry noted that there's plain old analog radio broadcast, AM and FM, and now there's the introduction of a new digital radio service. Uh, the US is not using the standard that the rest of the world uses, which is kind of typical of the US in the broadcasting world. We always have to have our own standard. Uh, the US digital radio standard uh, is variously known as IBOC for in-band on-channel or uh, DAB for digital audio broadcasting or HD radio for marketing purposes because it sounds uh, good. Not the radio, but the name of the radio. So we have this HD radio thing coming out. Uh, the sound quality is not actually better than FM if you have a good FM tuner, but it's digital. So presumably that makes it more subject to copyright infringement according to the recording industry. So they said, okay, people are going to be able to record this into digital files and then they're going to be able to share those files with each other. Uh, something they could not have done if it had been an analog radio service. Um, this is not true. We set up a couple of demos. We took analog FM radios, we plugged them into computers, and we recorded. And lo and behold, you can actually record analog media into digital files. It actually works. The extreme technical savvy of the EFF. Uh, but I mean, this is the oddity. Policymakers are actually impressed by this. You know, we made a, we made a demo CD. Uh, th th something we've been working on just this past week. We've made a, uh, prepared to make a demo CD of recording analog radio into digital and digital radio into digital, and they actually sound about the same, and you can't tell which is which. Um, and we, you know, we went to an earlier preliminary FCC meeting on this, and people were saying, like, can you really do that? Is that really true? Uh, you can't tell them apart? I thought one was digital, so it must be perfect, and the analog is noisy and everything. Um, so I don't know what to do about this conceptually, because it's become so ingrained. I mean, the entire rationale for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was that digital would be copyable, uh, so there needed to be special extra copyright laws for digital media, even though from the point of view of physics or information theory or signal processing, that was never true in the first place. But it worked well enough to persuade the policymakers. So we've got this uh, radio broadcast flag issue now where the recording industry is saying, well, we need DRM mandated by law on digital radio 
We don't care about analog radio because no one could infringe it, as we've been saying. But on digital radio, we need DRM mandated. And it's an unencrypted broadcast. We'll talk a lot about mandating DRM on unencrypted broadcasts in our 6 PM talk about the video broadcast flag. Um, we've been arguing against it, saying, you know, you could just record off analog, and you'd get the same thing, and there'd be just the same risk, and why don't you care about that? The other thing they said is in digital radio, you can actually tell what's playing. And so you might be able to write something or build something that would automatically rip things off air and identify what they were, and then you could have a collection of recorded music. Now, unfortunately for that argument, there are perfectly lawful MP3 streams of radio stations that give metadata identifying what's on. And you can use a program to record those MP3s from the perfectly lawful MP3 streams off the net. Uh, second, there's actually a digital metadata channel in current FM broadcast called RDS, the radio data system, where they actually tell you what's online, what's, uh, what's being broadcast, what's on air. So you actually can get that metadata out of analog FM. So you get the same quality, and you get the same, the same metadata to tell you what's on. And you can actually capture things and know what they are and automatically categorize them and have digital files. Uh, so there's no difference. But our current task is to persuade policymakers that this is so. Uh, and we'll give it a try. Uh, I guess that's about it for our introductory remarks. Uh, so I think, did you want to have Bill and then questions? Or OK. Thanks, everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to take questions at the mic up here. But because we're being unfair, we're going to let Bill Scannell go to the mic first. And um, <laughs> so he's our plant. He actually wanted to talk a little bit about his experience with EFF. But then people can line up behind Bill. And, um, and that's always good, because everybody likes to line up behind Bill, right? Yeah. In airports. In airports, especially. On the switch. <laughs> No, when I heard that the EFF uh, was having this panel, I asked if I could speak. Because it's one thing to hear uh, a, a bunch of lawyers and activists talk about the, the things that they're doing on behalf of their clients. It's another thing to hear what, they're do, uh, what the clients think about all of it. And the EFF was there for me and has been there for me for well over a year and a half. They've been there for, for many people in this room, whether you know it or not. The EFF is, is our insurance policy to allow us to go out and do the work that we do, whether it be with speech, with computers, with activism and whatnot. When any of us have a problem, if we don't think of it because we're too scared, we all have a friend that says, well, have you called the EFF? That true? Of course it is. Back in March of last year, when I heard that the United States government wanted to start color coding American citizens and giving them permission to fly, I was upset, I got angry, and this program, which some of you may know, it's called the CAPS-2 Passenger Profiling System, uh, made my brain explode. <laughs> and I was scared, and I was alone, but I went and put up a website called Boycott Delta. <laughs> I had strange cars in front of my house. Um, I continued to be scared, and then, and then the phone rang, and it was the EFF. And they said, this is great. <laughs> we're here for you, Bill. And they were there for me. They were there when I put up pictures of Homeland Security officials in East German uniforms in front of Airpoint Charlie. They were there for me when I started getting nasty grams from, from companies because they didn't like the fact that their data was being splattered all over the internet. They were there for me when I was getting complaints from, from all over the map of people who didn't like the fact that they were being publicly vilified for giving our data, our passenger data, to the government for them to analyze and profile us. Having the EFF at your back and watching your six is, is uh, truly a sight to behold. These people are not uh, you know, activists out of central casting. These people come from big law firms, from, from first-rate universities, who have chosen to give up literally multi-million dollar careers and work in tiny offices in San Francisco for you and for me. They're our insurance policy. 
And as a result, And as a result of having that kind of insurance policy backing me and other people, as a result of the EFF always being there for me and for you, two weeks ago, Tom Ridge announced that CAPS 2 was dead. <laughs> Freedom really isn't free and talk isn't necessarily cheap. The work that they do isn't out of thin air. It takes our money and our support, and not just buying the T-shirt, not just buying the, t the buying the, the the ticket or the book or whatnot. I'm sorry, just not not just us buying the T-shirt or the bumper sticker, not just us saying, "Oh, the UFF is cool." It takes our money. It takes our money to keep these people in business because they're working for us. I have an insurance policy. I've had one for a year and a half, and I will continue to have one as long as I continue to, to speak out publicly against, against evil government programs that are interfering with my right to travel in my country uh, freely without anyone knowing who I am and what I'm being tracked for. And we need, you, you can get the money later, sir. It's, ju it's just a dollar. But, they need your support, they need your money, you need the insurance policy, so I, I want you to buy an insurance policy. I want, to, want you to think about what the EFF is worth it to you when all of a sudden you get the nasty gram and you know the legal letter is crap, but you're going to have to hire a letter anyway. What is it worth to you to have someone like Wendy Seltzer go, <laughs> And I want you to open your wallets, and I want you to open your hearts, and buy an EFF insurance policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that moment of testimonial. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, you can come by our booth if you have now been roused into to giving money to us, um, and, and just talk to us, or get a sticker, or whatever. Um, I saw another EFF client earlier. I won't point him out because we're a privacy organization. But, uh, you know, it's nice to see our clients around. It's nice to see that they appreciate our work. Should we just go to questions Let's now? Take questions. Uh, I had a question dealing um, more with uh, copyright infringement. Um, it was about, um, I, s I guess I've always assumed that it's okay, you know, if you have a TV show that you like to watch just to um, tape it, you know, so, you, so that you can watch it later. Um, I was wondering if, um, what the legal implications are um, downloading this from someone else who has taped it and who has maybe edited out the commercials, that sort of thing, um, and what the legal implications are if you do that uh, just for your own use. Uh, sure, I'll, uh, as the copyright lawyer up here, the, the right to time shift as the taping of a show off broadcast television uh, is called was enshrined in a Supreme Court decision 20 years ago, the Betamax decision, <coughs> Sony versus Universal, uh, as we know protects the VCR for its substantial non-infringing uses, and one of those non-infringing uses, the Supreme Court said, was the right to time shift, take a show, put it on tape, watch it later. Um, as if that's a fair use. The question asked about downloading that show when maybe you didn't set your VCR, but somebody else did, or maybe you didn't subscribe to that cable channel, but somebody else did, or maybe you're in the wrong part of the country, but somebody else gets the sports show you want to see. Um, the copyright status of those is unclear, but likely to be on the infringing side of the line. Copyright law gives the owner of copyright uh, the exclusive right to copy, distribute, make derivative works, publicly perform, publicly display, and downloading ends up making a copy that you didn't, weren't authorized to make. Uh, the broadcast authorizes you to, to make that temporary time-shifting copy, but if you didn't get to do that, it's probably not going to be clear. There may be cases where it'll be a fair use, 
there will be cases where it's courts are likely to see it as an infringement. Collaborati well, collaboratively maintaining a list of commercial cut points, though, so everybody who has taped the show can cut on the same point and skip over the commercials, we think would not be an infringement. Collaborati an annotating the show, giving people metadata so that they can find it on their own hard drives, that's a good thing. That's not infringing. One of our other copyright lawyers has pointed out as a kind of interesting general observation about fair uses uh, that just because something is a fair use if you do it, does not necessarily in every case mean that someone else that you got to do it on your behalf would be protected. There was a famous case about a company uh, that helped people access remotely music that they had purchased. And it seems that it might be a fair use and perhaps is a fair use if you remotely accessed music that you had purchased, but a company got in a lot of trouble when they, on a profit-making basis, helped people to do that. Uh, so there's that interesting distinction between can I do this and can I get someone else to do it for me or to help me do it? Uh, and it might be that those questions are distinct from one another. Thank you very much. The company, by the way, was the offer Michael Robertson's mp3.com and the mymp3.com service. They got fined lots of money. Hi, can you guys talk a little bit about civil dis the role of civil disobedience and technical activism? The, if the geolocation thing you were talking about actually becomes law, it would seem that a lot of people would suddenly be paying attention where otherwise they're just sitting around hoping everything works out. Yeah, um, and, and uh, since you asked the question, I would say um, I actually neglected to mention that uh, if, for, if the Nitki case does not go as we hope, um, setting up a Tor node, for example, would be something that would be uh, a great form of civil disobedience, um, a good way to break geolocation software. Um, and in fact, there's other ways you can break geolocation software uh, by, you know, just filling in the wrong address each time you fill out an online form or... Um, can I mention why that's relevant? Uh, sure. Oh, um, and just, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Seth, why don't you explain since you're very eager. This is a digression from the civil disobedience question, but the relevance of filling out the wrong information. Um, through the Nitki case, we learned something that is perhaps not widely known, which is that one of the ways that geolocation companies find out which uh, physical location corresponds to a particular IP block is when people go to sites and type in their zip code in a form. If the company uh, to which you submitted your zip code through a web form has a certain kind of partnership with certain geolocation companies, they may disclose your IP address and the zip code you entered to the geolocation company to help them refine their database. And the, the geolocation company will then use statistical techniques and they'll say, hmm, it looks like eight out of 10 people who are in this particular IP block entered the same zip code on this form. Looks like that IP block is probably in that zip code. Uh, so this means that filling out web forms accurately uh, has the unfortunate side effect in some cases of helping commercial companies refine the accuracy of their tracking databases uh, with more accurate demographic information about where people are. Uh, so now back to the civil disobedience question. Um, and, and as I was saying, I mean, I think that uh, trying to do things uh, to break the mechanism that Seth was describing could be described as civil disobedience. They're not illegal. You're allowed to fill in an incorrect zip code when you subscribe to something or you know, are going on eBay or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that is a way that you can mess around with uh, government-mandated solutions to uh, stymieing uh, free speech. Um, do, does anybody else want to talk about other possible technical civil disobedience? A brief comment saying civil disobedience when it comes to computers isn't just like civil disobedience when you're, say, you know, making a chain at a, at a protest or something. There are serious criminal penalties that could accrue, uh, and you should really consult a lawyer. Um, so give a call to EFF if you have any concerns uh, about the legality of what you're doing. We don't do uh, computer crime defense ourselves. We don't do criminal defense, but we do know many criminal defense lawyers, people like Jennifer, and we can refer you, refer you to them. I won't ask if you recommend it, but I will ask if it's useful to you. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, this question is regarding chilling effects. Um, from my understanding, making false legal, th legal threats and legal threats, you know, without any basis is against the bar code of eth ethics. Um, do you think there'd be any success in pursuing some of the lawyers at these corporations sending out the letters with, you know, possible bar sanctions? And do you think that would be a good deterrent? Well, the, the tactic that we've been using is more one of shame by putting these letters online and letting everybody see the silliness in some of these letters. We tend not to go after the individuals because oftentimes cease and desist letters are written by the young associates who are at the low end of the law firm totem pole and they get to, uh, they're directed by somebody higher up at the firm who's directed by somebody at the client. Uh, we're, we look at ways of going after that kind of abuse with things like the declaratory judgment complaints. There, there might be times when an ethical complaint was warranted, but lawyers will tell you all, also that there are many shades of gray, and they'll argue that, in fact, there, were, there was a legal justification for even letters that seem absurd. Thank you. My question regarded the obscenity case. Whenever you. I'm afraid there's been an intervention. <laughs> we thought uh, it'd be appropriate to do a spot the Fed in the EFF talk. <laughs> I mean, where, where else can you really have some fun and have your lawyer here just to get you out of trouble? <laughs> I also want to say a few words on the hacktivism discussion on a more serious note. Uh, DEF CON, the staff of DEF CON, and the people affiliated with DEF CON, no way condone physical violence against individuals, destruction of property, threats, destruction of data, and so on and so forth. Those aren't anarchy. That isn't civil disobedience. That's, down, that's outright terrorism, murder, violence, mayhem, assault and battery, whatever you have it. So we do, we do encourage you, of course, to always, myself being a strict constitutionalist, you know, make sure that your rights are not taken away from you. But protest in a safe and civil manner. Don't blow shit up. Don't rob banks and say you're civil disobedience, you're bank robbers. Don't kill people, because you're murderers. And yeah, yeah, I've heard the old talk, what's the difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist? Well, your point of view. Well, we're not at that point yet, guys. And you know what, honestly, if we do come to that point, I'll be the first guy out there with a gun, preaching sedition. But we all know that we have a democracy and we can change via that democracy. Okay? What that means is you guys have got to get out there and vote. Okay? When 10%, when 10 of your generation votes, the rest of you, none of y'all, present you, shut up, and, shut up and sit the fuck down. Because you ain't got nothing to say. All right? If you don't like George Bush, fine. Vote for John Kerry or uh, the green guy, Howard Nader, or whoever. <laughs> All right? If you like George Bush, vote for George Bush. You want Mickey Mouse, vote for Mickey Mouse. But get out there and vote. The only way you will change the system is to vote. That's what it's there for. That is your God-given right as a citizen of the United States. Anything else, you're nothing better than Timothy McVeigh or Osama bin Laden. They're thugs and they're murderers. That being said, let's play about the Fed. Yes, sir. Stand up, sir. Sit down, sir. Just on a side note. Sit down, sir. I live in Washington, D.C. Oh, I'm sorry. You're actually, I thought you were about the Fed. I'm sorry. That's my I'm sorry. You were about the Fed. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I live in Washington, D.C. Yes. I don't get to vote for anybody. That's my choice. That is an excellent question that I do not have an answer to, sir, except to move. <laughs> 
that one I leave up to the, I don't know what to tell you but I, I don't encourage you to blow stuff up is that a choice <laughs> fortunately or, or unfortunately this kid will, will probably end up in a lot of trouble for what he said he committed four or five felonies just up there on stage okay and that made us real unhappy to see that happen but we want to have talks like that because we want that point of view shown and heard. We'll continue to have talks like that and we'll continue to make disclaimers like this. But like I said, we want th those people heard from because this is democracy and it's their right to speak. It's not okay to yell movie in a crowded firehouse or fire in a crowded, <laughs> crowded movie house. <laughs> I get those two backwards. I run into my local station and go, movie, movie! And they leave me like, yeah? <laughs> Try that. That's actually kind of funny. <laughs> and then when the cops come, scream, you'll never take me alive. <laughs> or get your friend to do it, because that's even funnier, because that way you don't get hurt. <laughs> but don't do any violence. Okay, so do you want to try to spot the Fed? Yeah. You do. You, sir. Oh, you, you, you're encouraging people to do it. You don't have a Fed. No, okay. Does anyone have a Fed in the room? They're, they're in the room, you know. We actually found a tape recorder in the back of the room, tape recording the whole session. We unplugged it. <laughs> no one wants to try spot the Fed. Come on, somebody wants to try. They're in here. Stop what? Because we wanted to do a spot the Fed during the EFF talk. <laughs> because that would be... We've got plenty of time for questions. They, because they have plenty of time for questions, and it would be cool in, like, the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation, where it's kind of the anti... Am I going too fast for you, sir? <laughs> where, where they're really, like, on the, the left side, where it's really cool, and the freedom fighters, and, like, the law enforcement, the bad guys, you know? Do you need pictures, sir? <laughs> I can draw them for you. Are you with me? Save it for your live journal, sir. No one wants to try to spot the fed? Yes, sir. Okay, there we go. We have one. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, sir, I'm priest. The, the man is actually at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yes, sir. Well, come on down. He's got that 300cc cranium and the sloping forehead and one eyebrow. It could be, a, could be FBI. <laughs> oh, he could be a foreign fed. Come on down, sir. That's okay. You can come down anyway. We'll make fun of you. Come on. It'll be fun. You have to come too, sir. Nice muscle shirt. Keep on out, sir. You'll get there someday. Come on up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come to the front, sir. Would you, do me, would you do me a favor, sir? Say, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> say, say, hasta la vista, baby. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> kind of a tenor, tenor terminator, do you think? <laughs> Where are you from, sir? Israel. Where, sir? Israel. Israel. Ooh, Mossad. <laughs> could be Mossad. Won't tell us, but could be. I'll probably be dead in the pool. <laughs> Where in Israel are you from, sir? I'm actually now from New York, but originally from Tel Aviv. Originally from Tel Aviv. What part of Europe are you in, sir? What part of Europe are you in, sir? What part of Europe? Where in Europe? Oh, in New York and Chelsea. Oh, in New York. I'm sorry. Is there a nuclear plant out there? Are they still going after that? <laughs> Where in New York, sir? In Chelsea. Chelsea. Hmm. <laughs> what do you do for a living, sir? I actually teach law in a New York law school and... We met Jennifer in uh, the conference that we organized it here. In the <laughs> See. So, so, so Jennifer's working for Mossad now. I'm done with that. You, you, you're sure that she's working for Mossad, really? You can tell us. It's okay. We have a scoop here, ladies and gentlemen. There's press in here. A famous EFF lawyer works for Mossad. Don't sue me for defamation, please. Thank you, sir. You can sit down. You're obviously an attorney. Would anyone else like to try spot the Fed? 
There are, I've, I know people in here who are feds. Are you guys that blind? <laughs> Just smell the cologne. <laughs> okay, in, in, case I'm gonna show, in, in closing, I'm going to share one of the best fed hacks I've ever seen done at DEF CON. This was done, I think, DEF CON 8. Okay? And this, is, this will show you how clever they can actually get. Every once in a while, we do get an original, th original thought. <laughs> they came in with a real high-speed, high low-drag camera system, bright lights, and a, and a booth babe. And they said, have your criminal picture taken here, <laughs> complete, with the, complete with the height. And they, had, <laughs> and, they, and they had a little number thing you could hold. They changed the number. <laughs> and every idiot stood up there like this. And like this. <laughs> and from DEF CON 8, they collected every single underground guy with their permission. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll send you the picture. Sure we will. It's about midnight when we kick in the door. <laughs> so if someone here asks you to take your picture, like that probably feds. <laughs> if it worked once, it'll work again. Thank you very much for being such good sports. <laughs> Next time. We'll, probably, we'll hopefully find a pet for you next time. Back to the regularly scheduled questions. My question was regarding the obscenity case. Uh, what separates the woman in question from the millions of hardcore pornography sites out there? Is there any distinction? And if not, isn't that selective enforcement? Isn't that what? Selective enforcement. I mean, are they just picking someone at random? Right. Well, again, um, back to the, he's asking what separates Barbara Nitke's website from hardcore pornography that would be considered obscene. I'm sorry? What was the? She's not being prosecuted or being pursued by the government in any way. She has actually affirmatively challenged the law herself. So she selected herself out. Uh, and it's because she's not a hardcore pornster, uh, but rather an artist trying to express herself, uh, that she uh, uh, decided to bring this case herself. So it's, it's people like that that, that help make the law uh, not stink. You really do need to stand up. And sometimes you need to be the plaintiff and not wait to be the defendant. So. I had a question about copy protection um, software, uh, mo notably uh, PC games, uh, recently apparently have been uh, putting in copy protection that uh, denies you installation of the software if you have other programs that could be used to copy it, install on your computer, like uh, Daemon Tools or Alcohol 120. Um, I was just wondering if there's a provision in the DMCA that allows this and if there's anything being done about it, just because the programs that uh, that it uh, searches for are legal on their own and the software is legally purchased but it still doesn't allow you to use it. Well, that's interesting. I haven't seen those uh, software copy controls in action. I'd be very interested in hearing reports on what that is. Um, so the, the DMCA anti-circumvention provision says you can't circumvent an access control and you can't make tools to for the purpose of circumventing access and copy controls. It doesn't say anything uh, about whether you can listen for other tools and refuse to install. Do these games allow you to return them if they don't install on your computer? Uh, no, because uh, all software vendors don't allow returning because of copy protection. Well, um, I'd be fascinated to hear more about this, because that sounds like a, a real abuse of the rights of the public as purchasers to use products in the way that they see fit and going way overboard to stop copying, you know, to stop people from using lawful debugger or other uh, programs alongside their programs without noting very, very clearly on the package, this game may not install on your computer, uh, could be a serious violation of rights and one that might be a copyright misuse, for example. The DMCA itself, in the DMCA text, uh, with one exception, does not impose any restrictions on the substance of what a publish what kind of DRM a publisher 
uh, may use or what kind of policy the DRM may enforce um, in, the, in the body of the DMCA. There are no restrictions except for one obscure one about videotapes uh, on what the DRM can do to you or how it can restrict you. But as Wendy says, there may be other interesting legal aspects to it. So, yes, I, I, another plea for you are our eyes and ears in the world. Please tell us interesting things like this that you're seeing. Email us, call us, let us know. I'm interested to hear more. Can I add something? Thanks. One of the problems here, though, is that um, you have a set of rights that are protected by law, and then you have a set of things that you are maybe not allowed to do that the law says, and then you have kind of private ordering or contracts of what the of what where you kind of negotiate with another entity what's going to happen. And the problem with these types of cases, the, the, the situation you're talking about, and also, also, for example, software licenses which say you're not allowed to reverse engineer or you're not allowed to benchmark or that kind of thing, is that um, the law tends to look at that as there's some kind of contract here and you agreed in exchange for buying this software and using it that you were going to abide by these particular terms and conditions. And the law in, this, in these uh, situations is really not very good for us. You know, you don't have a lot of choice necessarily as to what software you buy, but they nonetheless, you know, a lot of these contracts have uh, been, and licenses for software have been upheld. The thing that's really interesting about the case that you raise is, is your answer to Wendy's question, which is, can you return it then if you um, aren't allowed to install it? And the answer there is, is no. And so it could raise a lot of issues in terms of um, sort of unfair competition or, you know, that, that sort of thing, breach of contract or, or that sort of thing. But generally, I think we're going to see more and more of these situations where software licenses are constraining by contract what it is that people are allowed to do with the software, and there are no laws that say that we have a right to reverse engineer. It says copyright law doesn't stop you from reverse engineering, for example. Trade secret law doesn't stop you from reverse engineering, but there's nothing that says that software licenses can't stop you from reverse engineering or from running another kind of program on your machine while running this program on your machine or that kind of thing. And it may end up being true that we need affirmative legislation that protects our rights in these areas. Um, from what I've seen, it doesn't actually prevent you from running the program. It scans your registry to see if it even exists. So it's preventing you from e even owning the software. <coughs> or if you've uninstalled it, sometimes it'll pick up on dead registry keys. So that That's was interesting. Just Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my question is about the recent litigation with individuals downloading music, just these John Doe lawsuits, and then the certain ISPs that actually um, will give up their information. If somebody has an open wireless connection, which is obviously a lot of people if you drive through a neighborhood, and they're spec specific <laughs> specified in this lawsuit, what is the person to do? Is there any protection for them if, if they're open and, and, in fact, that they didn't do it? Uh, I can answer that. If you're not the person who, who downloaded the, who, who infringed copyright, let's say, whatever the thing was, that it was infringing, if you're not the person who infringed and, you, and it was simply an infringement that happened through a wireless service that you own, you're not going to be responsible for the copyright infringement. You didn't know about it. You didn't benefit from it. You couldn't control it. It's not your fault. The problem is, and one of the reasons why people like to secure their wireless access points is because of exactly what you're saying is that they're the first point of suspicion. So if the RIAA or the police come to your door because it was your IP address that was associated with whatever the illegal activity was, you're going to have some explaining to do. And it may be that then you have to show how it wasn't you. But uh, that, and then the, the sort of focus of suspicion will move onward. But you're not, you won't be legally responsible, but it could be a hassle. Right. Well, I mean, I guess that's the kind of the whole point is, is how can you prove it wasn't you? I mean, you know, from what you said. Well, it would be easy to prove it wasn't me because let's say it said that I was downloading the new uh, Madonna song at this time from this IP address, and then all I would have to do is show I don't have the Madonna song that was d downloaded at that time on my hard drive. And so then it's, it's clearly somebody else using the wireless access point, and it's wireless, and it's open, and you, they have to move on from there. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't necessarily be all that difficult. But it might be, but it, I mean, you know, who wants to go through that, right? right. If they didn't because I'd have the Madonna song I downloaded it the day before. <laughs> so. If they didn't believe you, you might have to go to court and have a factual dispute in court that would have to be resolved by the court. I mean, courts exist uh, largely to resolve such factual disputes. So you might say, I did 
this and they might say, no, you did this other thing. Uh, and in some cases it might go to court and be resolved in court, which is a difficult process. And you would need lawyers to represent you. Well, well, all, <laughs> like the EFF. Well, that, that's the whole point is with these lawsuits that, you know, like, okay, we're going to sue you for $300,000, but just give us 1500 and we'll, we'll go away. You know, it's cheaper to go to the $1,500 than get a lawyer. Unless, I mean, the EFF's not going to support every kid who's downloading music who, with an open wireless connection. But th that's, thanks for your that, information. That's the problem we've been raising in Congress. Hi there. I uh, really appreciate you guys coming. At, this is the first time I've ever heard of the EFF, so this is a new experience for me. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a journalist from San Francisco area, and uh, recently in my newspaper I ran a commentary that described how uh, the federal, I get, the wiretapping laws uh, have been, I get, well, they, they don't cover uh, transmissions that go over the internet, namely uh, voice over IP phone calls and uh, to a, a greater extent email. Uh, I don't know if, if this is under dispute or if it's currently, you know, uh, if it's been uh, substantiated that, that it's not covered in this, but it seems like a, a great threat to privacy well, in general. Yeah, um, electronic communications are explicitly covered by the Wiretap Act and by the Stored Communications Act, which governs access to messages that aren't in transit, uh, which is what the Wiretap Act deals with. And some of you may have heard there was a recent decision in, called U.S. v. Councilman in the First Circuit. <laughs> in this case dealt with a gentleman who ran a used and rare uh, online book service and offered email uh, service to his users. And what he was doing was he configured ProcMail to look at incoming email for his users. And if anyone was using Amazon, any email from Amazon was also copied to his box. So he could spy on what his users were buying at Amazon and use that to his competitive advantage. Now. You may think, well, hey, that sounds like a wiretap to me. It's, that's a message in transit. Uh, he was you know, getting it before you were getting it. He was getting it while it was being transmitted. But the law distinguishes between uh, those and those messages that are in storage. And you know, a common sense interpretation of that would mean a message in storage is one that has reached your inbox, is waiting for your retrieval. Uh, but the court in this case, uh, and the appeals court agreed, was they said that, no, since this had passed through any memory at all at the provider end, that being you know, through proc mail, or probably before that through the firewall, it had been in memory at some point. It had been stored at some point. And the reason this is an important distinction is that under the Wiretap Act, even providers are prohibited from intercepting your communications unless it fits into a provider exception, uh, where they are protecting their rights and property or doing what's necessary to maintain their network. There's no similar prohibition when it comes to stored communications. So even before this decision, it was totally legal for a provider to grep your email for whatever they wanted uh, after it was waiting for you to retrieve it. Uh, that was never in dispute. But what this court found was that uh, even if it's just you know passed through memory for a few milliseconds on its way to the inbox, even that is covered by the stored rules, not the wiretap rules, which means uh, your provider essentially has carte blanche to do whatever they want to your messages whenever, uh, look at it for any reason, do whatever they like. Uh, this is sort of a, a tempest in a teapot in the sense that they could already do this if they just waited a few more seconds. Uh, there would, that wouldn't have been any dispute at all that that was legal. But now, because of this case, uh, and because of groups like EFF and other privacy organizations making a big stink about it, the Hill's paying attention, uh, the Times ran an editorial, the Post ran an editorial, that gets the Hill's attention. And so now we have uh, an email privacy act that's been introduced in the House. There are various other uh, congressmen and senators working on bills to deal with this problem. And not only would they deal with the problem of this should be handled by the Wiretap Act, not the Stored Communications Act, they are also intending to make the Stored Communications Act more like the Wiretap Act by saying, no, even when it's stored, providers can't look at it unless it fits the exception. So we're trying to uh, maintain your privacy against email providers who, who may be uh, not quite so ethical uh, when it comes to looking at your email. Okay. Thank you so much. Hello. You all are my heroes, first of all. Um, That's very kind. Thank you. I work for a, uh, I'm a security architect for a very large corporation. I love the company I work for. I love my job. 
I found myself in a situation some time ago, a few years ago, where I was working on a project that I was required to sign a non-disclosure agreement that would have been a criminal offense to violate. And the project was one that I couldn't sleep with myself for working on. And I want to know what advice you all would have for anybody in this room that would ever find themselves in that situation. Luckily for me, I decided don't do anything stupid. I love my job. I love my freedom. I'm just going to hope that somebody else working on this project says something or something happens and it becomes public and it gets known about and eventually dissolved and that's what happened. So I can sleep again. But I want to know if you all have any advice for anybody in this room who may find themselves in those situations. Because as people who do security for a living and work with other corporations, I'm sure there are lots of people in here who may find themselves in similar situations. And by the way, what I did about it was doubled my uh, membership contribution to you all to make myself feel better. Well, that, <laughs> that's good. So. The, because the, the only real answer to that is to consult an attorney. We can't give some sort of broad advice about how to deal with non-disclosure agreements, particularly ones that may carry criminal penalties. I can only assume that was a government project because obviously if you sign a Google NDO, uh, non-disclosure, I mean NDA, that, you know, that's not going to get you thrown in jail. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the general rule is do what you said you were going to do until a lawyer says it's okay not to. Um, and if you have questions about it, you need to talk to a lawyer. Uh, we can't just say, oh, yeah, sure, it's okay. You know, if, if you have ethical qualms about it, screw it. It's no big deal. Um, you know, that you really, it, it's, it, you know, it's a shame that we live in a society that there are so many missteps you might make where you have to consult a lawyer. But then again, that's why people like us do what we do is so that uh, you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to hopefully, you know, get a quick answer on something. Uh, you can call us. Sure. You know, the interesting thing is that so much of what is done in technology can enshrine some kind of value system. You know, the technology can either take no note or no interest whatsoever in the notion of anonymity or privacy. It could enable censorship or filtering or that kind of thing. And we really benefit very much so from having technologists with a sense of civil liberties working on these kinds of projects. And I mean, and I think I agree with what Kevin said about the legal side, but from the from the technology side, you know, you look at the um, open way that the founders of the internet coded it so that it would be open and non-discriminatory, and that it would route around blockage. And and in all of that was a was a technological design principle, but it also goes along really well with this very fundamental democratic principle that um, th that I think kind of underlies. Yeah, see, democracy. That kind of underlies the way that we um, look at things here in the United States, and, it's, and I think it's, it's obviously the reason why the Internet's done so well. So I think that when you are encounter, when you're embarking upon some technological project, to bring to that project your sensibilities about civil liberties and about what's right and wrong is, is critically important. This project had no redeeming value at all, so <laughs> that wouldn't have, but I appreciate your Well, report. it disappeared, so you did good. <laughs> uh, my question's about the uh, Patriot Act, and um, my limited knowledge of the Patriot Act is condensed into Nancy Chang's Science and Political Dissent book, which has scared the daylights out of me, to be yeah, quite honest. It's very bright, and her materials are excellent. Okay. Um, uh, is there any guidelines or steps by which a... Um, not necessarily, well, I guess a webmaster might be able to take uh, if they have a site that maybe has things like uh, Howard Dean, um, Chomsky stuff, like links to things like that, so that you don't step over that line and end up uh, doing a stint in jail or something like that for the violating Patriot Act. Um, I'm not certain what, what kind of violation you're talking about. Um, most of the new crimes or expanded criminal penalties in Patriot uh, don't deal with internet stuff. Uh, deals with things like bioterrorism and money laundering. Uh, the greatest impact when it comes to the Patriot Act is the surveillance it enables. Um, there are some provisions specifically uh, regarding surveillance when it comes to hacking, for example, um, or rather uh, computer crime. I don't want to equate the two. Uh, but there is, for example, a trespasser exception to the Wiretap Act where a provider can say, uh, this person who is not our subscriber is on our system. You have our consent uh, to wiretap this person and they don't have to go to a judge to do so, even though uh, the privacy violation is the same, regardless of whether uh, your intent is, is ethical or not. Um, but I'm afraid, but as far as publishing 
uh, political speech, Patriot doesn't prohibit you from doing so in any uh, meaningful well, fashion. Yeah, I, I guess I guess I should clarify. Yeah, I, I, not so much the publishing, but I didn't want to get on a hit list. Basically, is what I'm targeting there. Well, the problem where, where do you draw the line where you don't step over and all of a sudden now you're under surveillance, like where you're just doing freedom of speech. Well, um, and is there a you're, you're, there, I mean, there is, they have been given broad powers, but it's not carte blanche. Uh, and they can't, they can't uh, say wiretap you or subpoena your records simply for publishing First Amendment protected speech. Uh, in fact, some of the surveillance provisions in Patriot, and in particular expansions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act surveillance, which is surveillance authorized by a secret court in uh, D.C. Uh, that only the DOJ appears before, and we never see their decisions or know their procedural rules or anything. Uh, there is a qualifier that says, but if you want to investigate a U.S. citizen, uh, or rather a U.S. person, um, you can't do it based solely on First, Amendment's, First Amendment activities. Um, so I, I think, if anything, my, the, you know, the key response to this is, don't be afraid of the Patriot Act. Don't be scared out of speaking your mind. Don't be afraid to engage in important political speech for fear of being spied on. The fact is, uh, you know, not, not, I don't trust the DOJ a whole lot, but uh, they do have limited resources, and they're not going to fritter those away trying to intimidate a Dean supporter, for example. Uh, and I don't think any of us should allow ourselves to be cowed from speaking out uh, because this law exists. If anything, we need to speak up loud. Louder. Okay. Thank you. My question has to do with the email that you email law that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, my company can come in and look at my email at any time, and also if I'm on my computer, they can also look at my Hotmail or my Yahoo because they have a um, uh, they have a tool that allows them to do that. But then also when I VPN from home, they they make it their, uh, that they can look at anything that I'm looking on while I'm VPN, VPN in. And I also understand that school systems now, if you have any email through any kind of college, university, or any high school, that they have that freedom to do that as well. Um, at what point does that, uh, does that stop? I mean, uh, schools, workplace, uh, and from if you're doing it from home, at what point can, I mean, is that going to stop? I mean, Well, uh, there, the provider exception that I was talking about, um, is important, but it is unfortunately a bit broad. It's it's the language. Uh, I don't have, know it specifically, but it's essentially uh, you can intercept as necessary to protect your rights and property or to provide the service. In those cases, you're giving your employer is the service provider or the school is the service provider. And so, if they have acceptable use policies that prohibit certain types of content or or behavior, they can monitor to see that you're not doing those things. Um, and also even if they didn't fit in under the provider exception, in, in the vast majority of cases like those you're discussing, they do get your consent, either when you sign an agreement when you start work, or they post some sort of banner when you log on saying you may be monitored. Um, so unfortunately, uh, there's, uh, there's no clear limit on, on that other than that broad exception. But uh, you know, as I was saying, when it comes to stored stuff, there's no limit at all right now. They can do whatever the hell they want and look at whatever the hell they want for whatever reason they like. And we want to at least fix that problem. Um, so. OK. Uh, what I was, was looking at is basically, first of all, what you were talking about the provider exception. What constitutes them being? What constitutes being a subscriber? Because, like, if my packets go from me 15 hops to where they're going, they're all I'm providers. Going. They're all providers. All of those hops. Okay. Uh, so they're all my provider, or they're all a communications uh, service provider. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you necessarily have a subscription agreement with them; they are providing the communications. That we are, I was going to uh, say the answer to this question is use crypto. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. So basically, yes, use crypto. Uh, uh, they're basically any of them can just say, "Well, they're that." So, in other words, I would be a. Uh, subscriber of those providers or would I be a trespasser because my packets are traversing their network as IP does? 
No, you would not be considered a trespasser just for basic internet routing. Okay. As, as far as uh, whether and what, to what extent they can look at your your messages, uh, before this councilman decision, it was presumed that those packets, as they were moving through those machines, were governed by the Wiretap Act, and so it would have to fit in to the provider exception. Now, after councilman, uh, if the Supreme Court uh, upholds it, if it's even appealed, uh, if the law doesn't change, uh, if councilman stands, that means okay. that they can look at those packets for any reason and at any time. Okay. Um, and so essentially your internet community, I mean, yeah. but this is, this is not news to, to this crowd. Okay. Uh, you've always known that, you know, your yeah. emails, unless you encrypt yeah. them, anyone can look at them as they pass, yeah. pass uh, through the internet. But this is something the public doesn't get. Uh, and, and luckily, things like New York Times editorials help yeah. inform the public, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's actually a privacy issue here, and you really need to, one, get Congress to pay attention to it, and two, take self-defense measures, which means crypto. Yeah. The other thing I'm looking at is the wiretap versus stored and what mm -hmm. constitutes stored, because, well, if my packets go in and they go through say 15 routers on the way to where they're going those packets were stored even for an infinitesimal mm -hmm. part of time now what constitutes stored uh, and what constitutes yeah. on the wire and according according to this decision uh even if it's just for milliseconds that's that was stored and so the provider can look at it any 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 way it wants and its disclosure of that would be governed by the stored communications act rather than the wiretap act as well so this isn't just important insofar as yeah as providers the thing is if 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 this isn't a wiretap if if uh you know copying packets out of proc mail into some other box is not a wiretap that means carnivore is not a wiretap. And instead of having to get a wiretap order, which is like a super warrant, which has yeah. lots and lots of additional uh, requirements, uh, you, they only need to get a regular search warrant, uh, or after a certain period of time has gone by, uh, merely a subpoena to install a carnivore box. Again, this, this isn't definite. This isn't what's happening now. Yeah. But these are the implications of this decision if it stands. Well, there's nothing that says, say, a version of Cisco IOS couldn't float that uh, passed certain predefined packets and it's that basically got, quote, stored for forwarding for the infinitesimal time that it's deciding mm -hmm. where they go, pops them out another interface to disk somewhere. Yeah, okay, well, we need to we need to um, hurry up because okay. we're running out of time. So um, I just want to say that the the person the last the brunette who's the last person in line you are the last person in line. <laughs> so that we're closing out the mic now. So so you the rest of you can actually ask questions. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, I know I'm not the only one who gets amazed at the level of ignorance and trust that people place into the systems, um, or the amount of abuse of that trust that goes on. And the EFF is defending and highlighting where these uh, congressmen or whatever can't do what they're trying to do, or where the commercial uh, people can't do what they're trying to do. From your perspective, do you have any uh, creative suggestions for how you can emphasize the other side of what you can do safely or how we can better educate um, people not to trust as much what they're trusting? Um, because it seems to be something that's missing quite a bit. I mean, I hate to, you know, all due respect to everyone here, but a journalist who knows about DEF CON and not the EFF and making laws now about making it potentially illegal to read email that's not encrypted, these are scary things to me. Um, do you have any suggestions for helping to raise that awareness? Um, certainly, there's all different kinds of ways that people can raise that awareness. I mean, largely it's through education. A lot of EFF's work in litigation does result in educating the public. Um, oftentimes, the media does pay attention to what we're doing, and we get a chance to uh, help people understand really complicated technical and legal issues and where they come together. Um, I think really the best way to combat this stuff is to, at least for us, you know, choosing the right legal cases um, that can really uh, make a great precedent um, or engaging in projects like our uh, Myth TV project that, just to plug one more time, uh, Seth and Wendy's panel is going to be about at uh, 6 p.m., um, you, know, develop, uh, you know, building pieces of technology that demonstrate uh, problems in the system, problems with copyright law, uh, problems with surveillance law. Um, but, you know, beyond that, there's no perfect panacea. I mean, it's basically, you know, on, even on an individual level, if you're an engineer and you can help explain to people at your office, 
to use crypto, for example, to go back to that theme, uh, that's terrifically helpful if people can come to understand that. So, I mean, but there's no, like I said, there's no perfect way that we can suddenly, we could implant chips in people's minds and control them and say, now you will understand the gravity of your actions if you do this. Um, oh, that'd be great if it were true, but then of course the government would probably take it up and we'd have to fight that. And yeah, for example, if you control an SMTP server, enable start TLS, it's really easy. Uh, and there is Seth educating the public. Um, but yeah, so uh, next question? Or? Well, uh, just one follow-up. I mean, it, it's just that listening to, and like I said, I didn't expect the EFF to do more, but listening to it, it comes back to the same thing. Demonstrating where you need to pay attention to this often gets branded as illegal hacking. Um, and then we need the EFF to defend us again. Uh, I'm looking for the way where webmasters who are not involved in this can be educating so that when the congressmen go, they're not going just because there was some outlandish event that got raised uh, by the, the uh, ACLU or EFF and now needs attention. I wanted more of a, uh, you know, that you get educated as you go. And it, it doesn't seem to be something that's easy to do. Um, thank you, though. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, and also, uh, I was wondering, what are the current legal implications of deep linking? Uh, uh, to information or such as like bomb instructions or something like that or just anything that can be deemed as that sort of information uh, deep linking uh, and also direct linking directly to a different website like uh, what I believe happened on raise the fist so so you're talking specifically okay um, well what happened uh, in regards to raise the fist this was a site uh, with a young man who posted uh, bomb making instructions and it is illegal to distribute instructions for making bombs with intent that those be used to make bombs and blow up people. Uh, Jennifer already talked about the idea of intent and uh, how amorphous and sort of thought crimey uh, a concept it is. Uh, and s we, we attempted to um, offer our services in that case, but there was a settlement reached by the defendant there, and so there, there hasn't been any precedent on the constitutionality of that law. It's kind of wacky in that it only applies to the distribution using the internet of bomb making uh, instructions with intent that they be used, and I, I don't see any real meaningful uh, reason for that distinction. But again, it hasn't been litigated yet. Uh, as a lawyer, as you're dirty, I would recommend uh, thinking very carefully before you post any kind of bomb making instructions. Yeah, what other information would be classified in like the same category as that? Like, I. Uh, I would have to look at the statute. Uh, I, you can come get my card and email me about it, and I'll look at the statute and get back to you. Also, this wasn't anything about me personally. I was Certainly. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I know that this has been so far more about law than about lobbying, but I sort of take an idle interest as a crypto anonymity type guy in things that might send me to jail in the next five years. Um, could you talk a little bit about this piece of legislation that's currently before Congress called Induce, why it's bad and how I can keep it from passing, and if it passes, how I can keep it from sending me to jail? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Induce. Induce <laughs> was a uh, bill proposed by Senator Orrin Hatch, whom you may remember from... <laughs> 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 Last year, he proposed that copyright holders should be able to destroy the computers of anyone they suspected of infringing their copyrights. <laughs> this year, he's back trying to add a new layer to copyright liability for those who aid, abet, or induce infringement of copyright. And we drafted up a mock complaint against Apple saying that under the Induce Act, it was likely that Apple could be sued for making the iPod. And Toshiba could be sued for making the hard drive that Apple used in the iPod to Apple's specs because all of those things could be used to aid and abet infringement and Apple rip, mix, burn, induce infringement. Um, terrible, terrible law being pushed strongly by the entertainment companies, MPAA, RIAA. Um, we have got together a coalition of technology companies, we got some of the uh, Intel, Yahoo, Google, Lots of strong technology companies have voiced their concerns about it. Hearings uh, took place two weeks ago. Nobody except Mitch Bainwall 
from the RIA spoke up in support, except for the Register of Copyrights, who also said, yes, we need stronger copyright uh, liability. They tell us that this was targeted at peer-to-peer -peer companies. It's not targeted at peer-to-peer -peer companies. It could make Sony liable for offering the Betamax. It could make Apple liable for uh, the iPod. So what can you do about it? You can write to your congressman and to make it, or congresswoman, and to make it really easy for you. EFF has an action alert. Uh, action.eff.org, come and add your own text to the letter that's already pre-addressed to your senators. Call them up, talk to them, talk to staffers in your home state, L help them to understand why this is such a terrible problem for innovation. If everybody has to ask permission from the entertainment companies before building new technology products, we won't get the new technology products. So, uh, thank you. As a potential sign of our impact, some proponents of INDUCE have suggested that INDUCE was specifically intended to reverse the decision in a case that was won by our EFF colleague, Fred von Lohmann. Uh, so it's nice when people feel, uh, not nice when they do it, but nice when they feel that they have to pass a law specifically to reverse a case that EFF won. Thank you. My question is a follow-on to the gentleman who was asking about the MP3 over unsecured wireless. It seems that um, you could be negligent for an unsecured wireless connection. Um, and it seems to me that we're really close to a lot of negligence problems. Um, you don't have zone alarm loaded on your home computer, so you're negligent for some kind of virus getting yeah. loaded. And Interesting question. Um, I'm because we're short on time. I think I understand you're asking, could negligence law be used against these people? Negligence is, is a specific legal concept that ap applies when you have a duty to act and you act uh, improperly or you don't act. Um, you don't have any legal duties specifically with regard to your wireless connection or with regard to securing your computer. Now, maybe you should, and maybe that's something that Congress should be thinking about. But maybe that duty falls with, say, the provider of the operating system that has so many bugs. Um, <laughs> and maybe some, maybe we need product liability for people making awful software. Maybe we don't. Um, but. <laughs> Tough problems, negligence applies very specifically where there are duties, and at least in the current world, uh, we don't have too many duties toward other people on our networks. Cool. Thank you. Hi, back to fair use. Um, it's my understanding that under the Copyright Act, it's considered to be fair use to make backup copies of movies that I buy. So it would seem that under the Copyright Act, if I buy you know, $50 Lord of the Rings DVD, and I want to make a backup copy, that's legal. And under the DMCA, it's not legal because it's copyright protected. So like, what's the deal? I know there's been some um, lawsuits going on in that. Do you have an update? Do you have any more information? Uh, the short answer is DMCA trumps any notions we previously had of fair use. We have made the argument to the courts that when you get an encrypted DVD, that blocks you from making fair use, not just the backup copies, but taking an excerpt to say, this is a terrible movie, don't go see it. That's something that's lawful under previous fair use law. So far, the courts have said, fair use incompatible with DMCA, too bad. And we are, we are continuing to fight that because we think that fair use is an important part of our free speech guaranteed under the First Amendment. Copyright law isn't supposed to trump the First Amendment, uh, but we are continuing to fight that and continuing to look for, again, to look for examples of the fair uses that are being blocked by overreaching copy controls. Thanks. Thanks very much for coming and come see us at our booth in the vendor area. <laughs> <laughs>